So my, my name is Martin Vianu. I'm coming from uh, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Switzerland, uh, most known uh, of Deutsch in ETH. Um, I will present you a new method, new fuzzing method, in order to uncover buffer overflows. Uh, normally, I will give all the background to understand things, so uh, the idea is to be uh, just cool, so don't, uh, don't be afraid of the technique. Yeah. So the, the idea, as you have seen probably yesterday, uh, another guy, Martin Jones, I think, presented new techniques and gave a sort of state of the art of the technique uh, used in order to find buffer overflows. But in this case, we never have source code. The idea, uh, in fact, is to test uh, softwares uh, under, for example, Microsoft Windows, but uh, under GNU2. So first, I'm sorry, I will just have to say you what is a buffer overflow. Probably you have uh, listened to this kind of uh, information for 1,000 times. Then I will give uh, the state of the art of techniques used to uncover buffer overflows. We will see exactly what is fuzzing. Then I will present you the technique called fuzzing by weighting attacks with markers. I will present you Autodafé, an implementation of this technique. And finally, just uh, two demonstrations. First, a small introduction. I wanted to speak a little bit about Alan Turing. Uh, Alan Turing is one of the fathers of the computers. Uh, he worked at Bleichley Park, and uh, his story is quite inter interesting because when he was there, he was wa wa with mathematicians, and he was not very well, because he said, I'm not very smart, I can't find something very uh, incredible in cryptography, in cryptanalysis. And the director of the blood shop said, say, okay, you have your own ideas of, the, uh, of how to cryptanalyze uh, si crypto systems, so try to do on your own way. And that's why he invented the first computer called the Bomb to do a simple exhaustive search. But in fact, Alan Turing was, for me, the first references of consequences of a functional error. In a paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, published in 1950, he tried to answer to the question, can machines think? And he reduced this problem to a game, the imitation game. So it's a very simple game. Now it's, it's famous due to CAPTCHA. For example, when you create an account on Hotmail, you have a small number, just twill, strange. You have to rewrite it. It's just to make the difference between a human and a script, a computer. It's quite the same game. First, you have a human, an interrogator. Then you have two entities, and for five minutes, the interrogators ask questions to A and B. There is one human and one computer. The goal is, after five minutes, to know who is the computer. If the computers can, be, can answer like a human, you can, say can, you can say machines can think. To do that, the goal of the computer is to influence the decision of the interrogator. You can use human psychology. For example, you give a computation to do, an addition. The computer can just simulate a reflection, a few seconds, and give, why not, a wrong answer. The question is, is it possible for the interrogator to use something to change to change the behavior, to influence the decision of a computer. Turing say, say yes with functional errors. For example, if we have a small processor, 8-bit processor, just recognize bytes, you can ask to add 1 to 2056, and it can answer null, so you can have sort of proof that you are speaking to a computer. 
but is there another solution to modify the decision of a computer? If we look uh, with uh, the case of a human, you can use senses, hearing, sight, touch, smell, taste, and with them, you can try to convince the human to, tr to threat him, to fear, or to torture him, always in order to influence his decisions. With computer, you have inputs, like inputs fields, protocols, files, RPCs, library core, or other stuff. But in fact, you cannot really convince threat, fear, or torture a computer. They are finite state machines. So there is a solutions, and now the most used is buffer overflows. So what is a buffer overflow? Very small example, few details. There is a, a simple call, the famous string copy function. This software just asks for an argument, copy it on a buffer of 16 bytes, print it, and exit. A small example, you give a string, and it just print it like this. Why functions are used? In fact, when you are when a software is trying to do something 1,000 times, especially before, the memory was a big problem. So the solution is to copy the same instruction for 1,000 times in the memory. But the idea is to use a function. A function is only on one part of the memory. And when you need to, do, to use this function, you just simply jump on an address. And then you execute the same routine. But what to do when the function is terminated? You need to know how to come back to, in this case, the main function. To do that, you use a memory, a part of the memory called stack. And there, you save the return address before jumping on the function. You save another value, not very important. And then you define, in this example, 16, a buffer of 16 bytes. And you see there how the buffer is filled. You start here, and in our example, you just fill like this. So the idea is if, if we enter data, much more data than the size of the buffer, you will simply overwrite first the save frame pointer and finally the return address. And then when the function will exit, you can say to the, to the process to jump in another part of the memory. In this case, it's possible because the function string copy, it doesn't check if the destination buffer, in this case, the buffer buffer, is big enough to contain the data of the argument. Uh, here is a proof using GDB, where you launch the same software, the program, you see that at the first case, uh, it's OK. And then you see these bytes are overwrite the return address because we receive a signal. In this case, a segmentation fault because in this address, you cannot execute an instruction. Uh, in practice, when you want to take control of a process, the idea is just to jump in a part of the memory you control and where the way, uh, there is what we call a shell code. For example, give you a backdoor or something else. There is different types of buffer overflows. We have seen here the basics, the school case of stack overflow. You have heap overflow, formal string, integer overflow, and other types. So now, Basically, how to the, the goal is to find buffer overflows in softwares. So how to do it? Let's see how our program is created chronologically. First, we have a source code. It's compiled, and you obtain a binary file. It executes, and you have the bi this binary mapped on the memory. On each step, you can try to find buffer overflows. The first one is simply to analyze the source code. And then you can try to discover, pot discover potential flaws. 
basic example presented yesterday is rats. And in our example, we have the results. First, the definition of a local buffer. And then, the most important, the, the, the use of string copy. The advantages of this technique is very fast. You don't need really skills. You can do this job automatically. And it checks completely the, the software because you have all the source code. But the drawbacks are you need the source code. And it's not always the case. It detects only what we can call basic vulnerabilities. You have a lot of false positives. For example, on SendMail, you have 4,000 uh, reports about just a stack-based buffer. And it's based on the name of the function. Uh, I remember um, it was Samba who was backdoored by, the source was backdoored for two days. And uh, he just had a define to change the functions like str and cpy, the secure version of string copy by string copy. Then, if you have just the binary file, you can try to do a static binary analysis. It's quite hard. In this example, it's the same function uh, using a tool uh, called IDA. The other pros is uh, it's the most in-depth method. You don't need the source code, but you need to, to know very well assembly. You can detect quite complex vulnerabilities because you have another abstraction, which is the machine language. The drawbacks is you need the binary software. And most important, you need very good human skills. And of course, it takes a lot of, lot of times. The third method is to use dynamic binary analysis. In this case, the first things you need is just to simulate an interaction. You need to have something who can use the software. It's what we call a fault injection tool or a fuzzing tool. And then you need a tracer or debugger in order to analyze the reaction of the target software. You have quite some examples. Uh, Protos, Fuzz, probably the most known spike and pitch. And for the debugger, it's quite uh, always the same GDB, Charlie DBG. You have Valgrind too, which can be used, or L traces, S trace. The, the fault injection is not really new. Uh, you can find this technique in order to test hardware, for example, even cars. Uh, the ID is just to do some basic changes, like a bit flip, and to, to analyze the reaction of the software. The goal is not security related, it's to detect bugs in general. And most of the case, the bug is detected because the software crash, or you have the memory, a full memory state. Or so what is the fuzzing? The fuzzing is, at least for me, a subset of fault injection because it was designed, it was invented to uncover uh, security-related bugs. Uh, fuzzing come from the word, the name of the first fuzzer called Fuzz, who was just a software uh, which create random strings and send them to, to, uh, to other programs. Let's see what the advantages and the drawbacks in practice. OK, a small example. It's a very basic protocol. You have first a fixed string, quest. Then you have a length, which corresponds to the length of the variable string. This length is on 32 bits, big and yum. And finally, you have a fixed string, n. If you want to try to fuzz a server, for example, which use this protocol. You use a fuzzer, and you have the server on a target. If you send random characters, or just A's in this case, most of the time you have check functions. In this case, the function 